All right, let's get started. So I'm here by myself trying to set this thing up. And we're going to talk about some interesting things. I shared on it yesterday as I was with some friends about respecting the process, enjoying the journey. But this is, let's just say, the backstory of that. Because a lot of times people don't understand, don't understand why, don't understand what they're going through. And I shared it in a nutshell with some friends. So I wanted to uh, finish it up, you know, kind of set the stage for it a little bit. So when we were talking about that. My main reason, my main purpose to explain and help people see how this works. Because some people will say Christianity is a process, you know, and I'm saying it's not a process, it's a relationship, it's a fellowship, it's a journey that you get to have with God and, and experience so many cool things. But so many difficulties happen, and my friend was sharing something that I've already talked about many times during sushi talk and how to get out of poverty and other lessons that I was trying to explain and share. A lot of people share that ask the same questions, but I'm praying, but I'm fasting, but I'm reading the Bible, I'm seeking God every day. Why is bad stuff happening to me? You know, we always feel like a victim and we have this victim mentality. And the more we are worried, the more we're afraid, the more we fight, the more problems seem to keep happening and just, where's the end? How do you stop this? How do you overcome this? <clears throat> and it seems like to kill all that stuff, it's like someone must have told us Christianity is going to be sunshine and rainbows every day. There's never going to be any problems. Everybody's just going to enjoy the, you know, life and everyone's going to be rich and things are going to be just exciting. And that's not always true. Life has challenges. Life, life has difficulties. Life has obstacles and difficult things that you need to go through. But it doesn't mean you can't enjoy the journey on the way there. When you read James, it tells us to count it all joy. I know pastors are really good at quoting stuff. I've read the Bible plenty, but guess what? I can look things up. I don't need to quote verse for verse and memorize numbers. So in James 1, 2, it tells us to count it all joy. When you fall into temptations, trials, testings, that all this produce, all this produces your faith will produce patience. And when patience has its work in your life, you'll be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. And I'm thinking, this is kind of cool. I was telling people, let's throw parties when you have problems. And let's just have a good time because we know we're going through these trials. And that's why it's good to have friends and people around you and have communities to support you when you're going through something. That's very important. But you see, you have to let patience have its perfect work in you. Patience is working something so amazing. All these fiery trials are heating you up and melting and purifying you till there's only gold left. So all the hay wooden stubble, all that stuff is burned, all that trash is burned, and you only have something so pure and so good to offer to God, to the world, and to your family. I want to talk about the Hall of Faith, or the Hall of Fame, as they would have in the Bible, in Hebrews. My wife recorded Hebrews too. if you want to listen to her voice, reading out the entire Bible, go ahead, enjoy it. She likes listening to the Bible in her own voice. I tell people, if you want to hear God's voice clearer and you want to understand it a little bit better, when you hear God's voice in your own voice and you hear his words in your words, that sharpens your mind to look for it. When you do hear God speak, you're more intuitive and attentive to it. You're like, wait a minute, because we'll talk a whole lesson on how to hear God's voice, but when God speaks to you, he passes it through you. So it kind of sounds like yourself, like you're talking to yourself. So if you fill yourself with the word of God, when he does speak to you, it will just start making sense. And you would be like, hey, I recognize this. This is God. This is his voice and his words sound just like my words, and just like my voice. And it makes so much sense. But we'll get into that in a little bit. So enjoy Hebrews if you want to. It's one of uh, the juicy books in the Bible. 
<clears throat> a lot of time we have uh, such interesting stories and everybody thinks that their story is important and if you listen to anything else I said in my earlier ones I don't care about your stories I don't care about your dramas I don't care about all that stuff I care about you but everybody has a story save it everybody has a story everybody wants to exalt their story over God's story because his story trumps your story and when his story comes into your life and he starts living and helping you enjoy this life then everything becomes so so easy so simple there's less stress there's less pressure because he wants to live through you and help you do everything and you learn to lean on him you learn to let him help you through this so you don't have to do it alone you'll never have to ever be alone when he lives and helps you and guides you through this life that doesn't mean see everything i'm going to share is a little bit relative it's you have to relate it and compare it to something for your mind to understand it. A lot of times people don't see the value or don't understand the balance of how things happen in life. Sometimes you might think, well, my life's not fair. I'm not as wealthy as I should be or I don't have as much stuff as I could. People have a better life than me. And we try to judge ourselves, and everything is very relative. I was with a friend and I said, look, you have a mansion. You have so much nice things. And he's like, what do you mean? I have a one bedroom apartment, it's so small. I said, are you kidding me? There's people who have absolutely nothing, yet you have something. Yeah, but that guy has a bigger house. You go to the guy with the bigger house and they're depressed and you're telling them you should be excited. Look how huge your house is. You have a two bedroom home, it's, it's amazing. You have a big backyard, it's, it's great. Yeah, but you know, I, I just wish I had that other bigger house. And, and it seems like the more you have, the more you realize you don't have and that's the false motives and readings people have they always want more they always want to see and have uh, they always want to have something that no one else has and I understand but let me show you how they got there say for example you know you want to be as rich as King David was in the Bible you know or as rich as Solomon. You start looking at people in their, in, and you start reading about them, you're like, well, I want what they have. Okay, let's just say David was one of the heroes in the Bible, loved God so much, and you know had such a desire to build a temple and gathered so much wealth to build God's church and say, that's your thing. You're an entrepreneur, you're called to be a king in, in the Bible or even in life. You're called to produce wealth. You're called to generate income so that the church and the, the temple could be built, made out of human beings, lively stones. That's what you're trying to build. Okay, you want to be like David, but you just want the wealth without doing anything, without going through anything. Here's what happened with David when you start reading his story. This guy, he was kind of rejected, hung out with the sheep his whole life, just sat there, and didn't do a whole lot. You want to be like, like David, right? You want to have nice things, you want to be wealthy, you want to be a king, you want to rule nations. Well, check it out, check out his journey that made him the man he was. He spent most of his time with the sheep in fellowship with God, playing on his harp. That's how he spent his time. How do you spend your time? When a wolf, or well, in here, a bear or a lion would come after his sheep, Things would come and try to steal things from him. What did he do? He fought them and killed them. Now think about it. Do you want to face any of those circumstances? Would you want to fight a bear or a wolf or a lion or anything coming to get your sheep? Think about it. He had to go through so many difficulties. And then he got looked over. He had so many brothers. Then his brothers even put him down. What are you doing? You just want to be a cool hotshot? You want to come see the, the army? Then he had to fight a giant. Because he had that passion. He knew God. He spent time with God. He knew that God would deliver him into his hands. Again, he spent time. And then what happened? Did he instantly become king? Then he followed after Saul. And Saul was the king at the time. And Saul kept constantly trying to kill him. 
And then Saul chased him all around the desert for, I don't know how many years, but let me look it up. Let's look this up, because I want to see. I want to see how many years, how long did he have to, because I don't know if it says. It said Saul reigned 40 years. Anyway, I don't have the exact. Come on, Google, you got to help me out here, dude. Anyway, <clears throat> David was chased in the desert kept constantly running from Saul and his armies. Do you want to be one of those vagabonds that hangs out with thieves and robbers and those people who've been kicked out by society? Those are the people David hung out with, and he was constantly on the run. And when people attacked Saul's cities and instead of Saul defending them, David went and defended what Saul should have been doing. This is the life that David lived. And then, hey, David became king. You think the story's over? The story's just getting started. Then he had his own children raping each other, killing each other, chasing him out of the city, stealing his throne, having to fight, and his soldiers kill his favorite son. And then Solomon eventually takes over. You think it's over? No, one of the other brothers tries to steal the throne. It just turns into such a mess. This is what happens to a guy who loved God and had a great life. You don't understand the journey that most people go through. You don't respect the journey. You don't see the difficulties they went through. And if you want to have what they have, what makes you think you will just stroll right in, wake up one morning, and you have everything? It doesn't necessarily work like that. You will go through things but it's the perspective that you choose to have through the middle of it that matters. When you learn to count it all joy, you learn to enjoy it, you learn to respect this process of growing and learning and being perfected and being mature. As you see, when we read James, it says, letting patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, mature, and lacking nothing. You will grow in maturity. Now let's just say you wanna be one of the most powerful people on the planet. Sure, you can have that. Let's just look into the story of Joseph. Joseph was number two. He literally ran the entire nation of Egypt. You want to be like Joseph, run an entire nation? Let's see what Joseph went through. First, Joseph starts having lots of dreams. I have a dream. How many times have we had dreams? We've had so many dreams, so many visions. What happens? His brothers laugh at him. His father thinks like, what the heck is wrong with this kid? Does he think I'm going to bow down to him? Then they sold him into slavery, throw him in a pit. Then he lives as a slave for a while. Then he gets locked up in prison because false accusations. Then he lives in prison for a while. And then eventually after years and years and years go by through all of this, finally, he has his opportunity to share and help the king and resolve an issue. And then the king says, man, we're gonna set you as the most powerful ruler. There's no one stronger or bigger or more powerful than you, than myself. So you can do whatever you want and I trust you. That's pretty cool. But you don't know everything he went through. Then his own brothers come to him after he's a ruler. And man, what do you want to do to those guys that hurt you, that broke you, that tried to ruin you? You see, you want things, but you don't want to go through this journey that life has for you. Now, if you choose to walk with God through it, it doesn't mean, did Joseph walk with God? Well, he did his best. Did David walk with God? He did his best, but he still went through things. See, I go through things all the time. And I have friends who go through things all the time. But I found out that if I choose to see it from the right perspective and walk it out righteously, then the journey is enjoyable. Then I can enjoy it and count it all joy when I go through all these things because I understand Mark 4. I know the enemy's trying to steal the word. 
I understand that the storms, as we talked about earlier in one of our videos about Luke 6, the devil will constantly come and try to try to ruin, try to change your circumstances and see if you will change. Because he knows you don't really love God. He's trying to check it out. Do you really love God? Are you sure? Maybe you love your own skin. Maybe you love only when God when your circumstances go well. He's constantly trying to prove to God that people don't really love him. They need you. They don't really love you. They don't really pursue you. They only want what they can get from you. So you have to figure it out. How do I want to live my life? Do I serve God just so I can ask him for things? Do I serve God just for money? Do I serve God so I can have a great life and a good wife or a nice husband or whatever you're looking for? Why are you serving God? Why are you giving him your life? What is the why behind your life? And I must have shared this already, but I really like this quote. The two most important days of your life, the day you're born and the day you find out why. When you find your calling, when you find your purpose, that's, in a, great, that's a great day. That's so enjoyable because you're finally living out your destiny, your purpose. I know a lot of people don't want to believe in destinies. I want to create my own destiny, my own path, my own vision. Go for it. Walk it out. God's not going to micromanage you. He's not going to force you and cause you to submit to his will. He's going to help you. He's going to guide you. God has a plan for you. If you don't know what to do, God has plans and visions. But guess what? All the details, all these little things, he gets to help you. He's helping you. The Holy Spirit came to help you, to lead you, to guide you, to teach you. He doesn't want you to try to suffer and figure it out on your own. He's there to help. You're not supposed to suffer and struggle. He will help you. He will guide you. I've heard of Christians who get born again. And they're like, wow, my life changed so fast. Everything I wanted, it happened. Everything I needed, I got it. And then you see other Christians like, man, I suffered for years before I figured out anything. It was such a, a long process. And then you start thinking, is Christianity a process or is it something instant? Now this is where the exception and not the rule. All things are possible to him who believes. That's the rule. And everything else that we do turns into an exception. Most of the things we do in life, it's our choices that get us where we're at. You are where you are because of the choices you made. Now I understand your parents made choices for you or your parents dictated to you what you must do and you're young and you have to follow them. But as you keep growing, you have choices to make. And you must make the choices to get you where you think you wanna go. And do you know everything? How can you know anything outside yourself? You only know what you know. That's why I like to surround myself with good friends, multitude of counselors, people who I highly respect, and people who can speak into my life. Now, I don't always listen to them, but I sure appreciate their advice, and sometimes I do, and it really helps. I had a pastor friend. One time I liked this girl, and I wanted to pursue her, and, and he said, Paul, uh, do not do it. I got to know her, and man, do not do it. You're going to be extremely sorry if you do. And for the first time, I guess, in a long time, I decided to take his wisdom, and I listened to him. And I told him later, he said, did you ever pursue her? I said, no, you told me not to, so I left it alone. And he said, wow, you're actually the first boy out of the thousands of boys I've told this to that's actually listened to me. Because most guys usually pursue that person no matter what, and they don't care about anyone's advice. And then after they get burned, after they ruin themselves and their life gets miserable, they're like, man, why didn't I listen? So sometimes it's great to listen to people when they advise and suggest really mm, crucial informations, 
a crucial piece of information. Say, for example, you want to marry somebody, and then you're like, I don't care what anyone thinks, I like her. Or someone prophesied that I'm supposed to marry her. Really? Well, what about all your other friends? What about everybody else? All they see is that this girl is just lying or cheating or she's not doing everything right. Yeah, but I had a prophecy that I'll marry someone soon and that's her. And we start like hinging our whole future on a prophecy or something when we don't even spend the time to get to know the person or that person doesn't even know us and they're blind and they're just falling in love and want to marry us. They don't understand and we have to honor them and guard their hearts and respect them so we don't cause them to fail or end up in some kind of messy divorce because their eyes will be opened after a year of marriage and they're going to be like, you are miserable and I don't like you and I don't even know why. I guess love was blind and, and I just don't want to see that. I want people to really hear God and to follow God on this instead of their feelings and emotions. But people will do what they do and everybody talks. I heard this phrase and I liked it. Birds fly, fish swim, people talk. People talk. And everybody wants to tell you their thoughts, their opinions, their logic. And this is what a pastor friend said that I really liked. He said before all the media and everything took off, people who had wealth, people who had money would be on TV and they would be sharing their thoughts, their messages, their sermons, their points of views, and they would have a following, and everyone would follow them, right? Because they're on TV. They have it all together. God must have blessed them, obviously, for them to be this successful, so people just start figuring it out. But now, everybody on the planet has a platform. Everybody has an Instagram, a Facebook thing, a YouTube channel, so it seems like everybody is you know, a ministry or someone to follow. Everyone has a blog. Now what happens? Now you're listening to a thousand voices. You don't know who's right. You don't know what's going on. And it's hard to figure out who to follow. That's why I'm so glad when we were seeking God for a while and God introduced us to Pastor Dave Roberson and his book, The Walk of the Spirit, The Walk of Power. It's free on Kindle. I'll add a link below. They have it in many languages. When I read it, I first was really hesitant, but the more I read and the more I saw, it's just his testimony of, I sought God and I found him. And I like Pastor Dave so much because he never pointed to himself as much as other ministries or preachers would. He always pointed to the Holy Spirit as your teacher. He always said, I'm not your mentor. I'm not your teacher. I'm not your guide. That's who the Holy Spirit is in your life. And he constantly showed us how and explained it. Most pastors might say that, but they don't show you the how to engage with the Holy Spirit. They don't teach you how praying in tongues works. They just say, yeah, it's good, just do it. Yeah, just follow the Holy Spirit. And that's the extent of their teaching on the Holy Spirit. They really don't know. Most people really don't know how the Holy Spirit works, how to engage with him, how to have him teach you, how to hear his voice, how to really understand your calling, your future, what God has for you. That's who the Holy Spirit is in your life. You're not meant to be alone. He's going to be there to guide you every step of the way if you so choose to. So, <clears throat> I love Pastor Dave. I love how he taught us these things and he helped us. And now, whatever Pastor Dave does, whatever anyone online says, it doesn't matter. I don't follow a man. I have the Holy Spirit who leads me and guides me into all truth. I like to listen to certain people. I like to learn. I like to glean some information. But the Holy Spirit recently spoke that to me. And I recorded this very recently. The prophetic word for the day on 11 6 20. And then I have the, that same word without the commentary without just, just me reading through it. The Holy Spirit's like, what are you doing? Why are you trying to just follow men, listen to what this guy has to say? Well, this guy has a revelation, this guy has it. Why aren't you listening to me? Why aren't you speaking to me? Why aren't you walking with me? What What's this new age thing you're pursuing? 
The Holy Spirit talks pretty straight up when you spend time with Him. He doesn't let you flounder around and waste time trying to follow every gust of wind, every new doctrine that comes around. You build a relationship with Him. And I have a friend who whenever I learn something and God speaks to me, and then I apply it in my life and it just becomes one of my cornerstones that I live. My friend would say, hey, uh, so-and-so teaches the same lesson and it's amazing. I like it. I was like, yeah, I'm living it. I'm not just listening to a message. I was spending time with God. He taught me this. This is how I live. Oh yeah, that's wonderful. And then this is another thing I learned. Oh yeah, so-and-so teaches this lesson and it's so cool. Yeah, I live this every day. This is my life. This is what the Holy Ghost showed me, and this is what I do. Many times you can listen to so many amazing teachings, sermons, lessons in life. You, you learn so much, but if you don't apply it, you don't live it, and it doesn't become bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. If you eat a banana and it goes in you, it becomes a part of you. All the nutrients, everything gets assimilated into your body it becomes one with you now how can you take it out it's already in you you're not going to vomit that thing up your body's digesting it so fast that it becomes a part of you now here's what happens a lot of times we hear so many sermons and so many people tell us these great mysteries and secrets but until it becomes one, until you eat this word and it becomes a part of you and it builds strength in you and it helps you, then did that word do any good to you? Did it help you? <clears throat> sweet, sweet lemonade. Mm. Did those words help you? Those messages, those things people told you in life? No. Because words get stolen and things that are from God, they might get robbed out of you. Mark chapter 4. Marcos capítulo 4. That's all, my friends. Mark chapter 4. Look it up. The enemy will continue to come to steal the word. That's what he does. Because you're not living it. You're not doing it. That's why you are where you're at. Well, I have all these promises. Well, are you believing them? Are you contending for them with the prophecies that were spoken? Are you doing warfare with them? Are you speaking these things? Are you seeing these things? Are, is that transforming your mindset and your belief systems and your habits and your patterns? No, it's just something you listen to and you like it and then you go discuss it with a friend and then you look for the next revelation. You don't live it. That's the mistake that I think that I made too many times going to church every day, listening to sermons, hearing people's thoughts and opinions. And then instead of applying it and living it every day, I just can't wait till the next service. And I had a friend who was like, I can't wait till the next service. I love how Pastor Dave teaches. I want the next service. I love Pastor Dave. And I love the services. And they canceled one of the services because the roads were covered in ice or something like that. And they're like, oh, I hate it. I couldn't go to church. I need to go to church. And we develop these mindsets of going to church and listening to a pastor and we, we develop these kind of unhealthy mindsets instead of developing a relationship. I said, well, what did Pastor Dave teach you? He taught you to spend time with the Holy Spirit. But I need a fresh word. I need to be there so he can tell me something, you know. And I appreciate when people honor men of God. And the Bible says that, you know, that one of those ministers of the Gospels, they're, they're worthy of double honor. You don't just honor them in words and with your life, but... You also help them financially, you help their ministry, you help them continue to do what they love to do. But we can't forget that no matter how much we honor man, <clears throat> we honor God first. We pursue God first. That's who we seek, that's who we live for, that's why we're alive. I used to speak with my friend and I said, hey, if Pastor Dave stops preaching, would you continue to like walk with God what if he just says hey guys I'm done with this church stuff it, it's all fake I don't believe in any of this Christianity I'm done would you continue to walk with God because your hero let you down would you keep going and a lot of people they start exalting man over God and they said hey if he's done I'm done if he can't make it I can't make it 
Since when do we set our standards so low to look at man as our pattern, as our example, instead of keeping our eyes on Christ and watching his life? People will let you down. Spoiler alert, right? People will let you down. People might fail you. People might not do things the way you always think they should. But guess what? You still get to keep your eyes on Jesus. You still get to keep walking after him. And the Holy Spirit will never let you down. He's always there. He's always on time. That's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's who you can build relationship with. That's who God wants you to walk through life with. Now, people can add to your life, encourage you, support you, help you find a more excellent way to walk with God. But in the end, it's your choice. No one can stop you. No one can hinder you. No one can <clears throat> take you out of his hands. You choose to walk away. You choose to leave. No one can stop you. And it's not my job or my responsibility to prove anything to you. You spend time with God and prove it to yourself. Prove it to yourself and allow yourself to figure this thing out on your own. You don't need me to constantly try to push you and encourage you into that direction. Figure it out on your own. Spend time with him. I don't quote Leo Tolstoy from War and Peace, his little work of art that he has there. I haven't read it, but maybe if I'm on a desert island and I got nothing to do. <laughs> but he quoted something or he said something I saw and I thought it was kind of interesting where he was in a church and he's like, this isn't where you find God. You find God out there in the solitude, in the jungles, on the beach, and wherever you are, that's where you can find God. You don't find him in a church. God is always looking for you, and he's always trying to engage with you. And when he walked into the church, he just didn't like it. But he loved God. He loved to talk to God all the time because I think because he was in the Orthodox kind of uh, system there, they had the Orthodox church, and he just said, guys, you don't find it in the church. And they don't want to help him. And then they find out he's Leo Tolstoy. Oh, we'll help you with everything. He says, you see, you have no spirit of God in you. You only want to help me because you know who I am and I've done something. You didn't want to help me earlier. That's how life is. You can find God anywhere. Some people say, well, I don't like going to church. I'm like, don't. Don't. The word church is ecclesia, called out ones. You are people that were called out of this world into the kingdom of God. You are the church. My friend says, well, I like fishing. I said, good, go fish all day. I said, what do you do in your mind all day when you're fishing? He's like, well, I just talk to God. I'm like, there it is. Who do you talk to? Where do your thoughts go? Who do you engage with, with your heart, with your imagination, with your soul? I engage with God. I talk to him no matter what I'm doing. I said, that's church right there. He's like, I didn't realize it because my wife and everyone keeps forcing me to go to church. I'm like, don't. Church isn't the answer. The church means the body of Christ. People coming together, working together. Yeah, that's good. That'll help you. But sitting in a building and playing some kind of games, that's not what it's for. It's for you to live out the life of God that he has for you. It's enjoying this path, enjoying this journey. Otherwise, why do it? I don't want to do it. It's not worth it. And this reminds me, we uh, watched The Matrix the other day. And I have a friend who I met in Japan, and we were talking about it. And I said that The Matrix is, of course, it's just an action movie to some. But there's a lot of type and shadows and allegory, metaphors of Christianity. Neo got born again. He got unplugged. So spoiler alert, if you haven't seen The Matrix, go watch it. But I'm not going to give away too much. There's three different movies to it and different parts. And Anyway, but the first one was so good because it's just literally... I, I met a stranger and I talked to him the whole time as though he was Neo. And I was Morpheus. And I constantly sat there and talked to him 
the same way. It freaked him out so bad. And I was wondering, why am I talking about the Matrix so much? Why am I constantly engaging with him on this subject? And then he tells me, in college, I wrote my thesis statement. I did my research and I wrote my papers to get my degree on the Matrix and how we're still in it. And I'm looking for a way to break out. He was Neo. It was so cool. God set it up so beautifully. And we stood there talking about it. And everything that I linked from the movie to his life, this guy was just so blown away. He's such a cool friend. And I was just telling him all these amazing things. And he's like, this is so insane. It's literally like, you guys are trying to come and rescue me. And I'm in the Matrix. And I've been looking for a way out. Help me. Help me figure this out. And all I can do is offer him the red pill or the blue pill. Now it's his choice when he takes that pill. And I can only show you the door, but I can't push you in there. I can't force you. You have to make those choices. And of course, you got people like Judas constantly trying to betray you and trying to, you know, Christians who got bitter and say, I hate this. I wish I can get plugged back into the matrix. You got those kind of Christians. And anytime I was laughing with my friends watching it, anytime they would say, Jesus, Trinity would say, yes. <laughs> oh, God, yes. It's like she constantly is aware because that's her name. That's who she is. She's constantly aware of you. Sometimes I hear the Holy Spirit's like a woman, you know, she's so gentle and tender and motherly. And the Holy Spirit is constantly there to help you. And no one can tell you you're the one or you're the Christian or, or you're the guy who's supposed to do it. But you get to figure it out. You get to walk this out. You get to enjoy this life and figure out who you really are. When you spend time with God, he will show you who you are. He will help you understand this. And you can become all that you're destined to be. I really like when they said to Neo, you know, but what about these agents and these demons and devils that come to constantly attack you and keep you depressed and bound in, in this system? And he says, well, when you believe who you are, you won't have to dodge bullets. He's like, you mean I can dodge bullets? He's like, you wouldn't have to. When you know who you are as a son of God, you no longer have to fight devils. You no longer have to fight on their plane. You can literally blindfold it, take the enemy out. You, you literally don't have to fight and struggle because you know who you are. When you don't, guess what you do as a Christian? You run from the devil. That's what my friends do. I talked to them and they said, well, it's hard and the devil's attacking me and I'm constantly running and I need a new prophetic word to help me. Well, what are you doing? Well, you're Neo in the Matrix still figuring out who you are. Yes, you're born again. You got unplugged from the system. You figure out what reality really is. That's why when I look around, you're asleep. You're still asleep. You're still plugged into some form of religion. You are asleep, Neil. Wake up. Because when you wake up, you have such a soundness, such a sanity. You can see things so clearly. And you look around and everyone is still plugged into the matrix. And if you try to unplug them and they don't want to, they will fight tooth and nail and call you a religious bigot hatred, no heart, and all you're trying to do is help them wake up and show them there's more to life than what they see. You can do impossible things. But nope, a lot of people just want to hold on to that ignorance is bliss mentality. They're so ignorant, they're just living asleep. It's very sad. And usually I can spot a Christian, very simply. You can walk into a grocery store and look around. And you can tell most people, they're pretty dead inside. There's nothing here. They're just asleep. They're, they're dead. And some Christians, you can see their eyes are lit up. They're like, they're alert. There's this sparkle that glows in their eyes. Like, they're starting to believe who they are. Now there's Christians who are born again, who are sad, who are depressed. I've seen those. But what I'm trying to say is people who start believing who they are and start walking with God, there's this glow about them. They're so excited. They're so kind, they're so loving. Now I've met people who are loving, who don't know God, but they're, they'll give you the shirt off their back, they're very good people. But man, you do something they don't like, and they'll turn on you. You don't always do what they like and what they tell you to do, they will turn on you. And I've seen Christians who are mean as a snake. I've met the whole family of mean Christians. But guess what, it doesn't matter how they treat me, it's how I choose to respond and treat them. Not everyone who speaks to you 
Do you give them a voice and authority in your life? I don't let them speak into my life. I hear them, but I don't let them speak into my life. They're nobody to me. They're just a brother in Christ who doesn't know who they are yet. They're hurt, they're broken, and I get to love them. I don't have to fight with them because I choose to see with a different perspective than they see. So I want to do a whole thing on the matrix and go through all the types of shadows and go through the whole allegory, but just check it out and see if anything stands out to you. I like that movie. I think you might like it too. My wife's like, there's a lot of cussing in there. And I was like, eh, I guess there's a couple words in there, but you've seen and you've heard so much in this life. And I'm thinking, I like how Jesus doesn't split hairs. I did this whole thing. God talked to me that I might do a whole lesson on it because it was just way too good. Now I'm starting to record things because I'm tired of repeating myself a thousand times to a thousand different people sharing different Oh, the same thing over and over. So now I'm just trying to record it. And my mind's like, yep, I already said that. Yep, I already said that. Listen to this message. Listen to that one. And now I don't have to keep repeating myself. <clears throat> this one was really cool. If you call your brother, uh, your brother an idiot, or you say Raka, you're worthy of hellfire, you're worthy of the judgment, you're worthy of the courts. And I've heard that stuff. And... To me, I just started, I've always wondered, what does that even mean? You know, I can't call anyone a fool or an idiot. Well, the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Well, if you say there is no God, uh, you're a fool. The Bible calls you that, and I can call you that. Very simply. Paul writes to the Galatians, you foolish Galatians. Well, they're acting like a bunch of fools. Who's practicing witchcraft with you? Why are you betraying and walking away from God to go to a religious system. What are you doing? You start off in the spirit and you're going to finish it off by doing duties in the flesh? What are you doing, guys? Calls them fools. Start reading Proverbs. Calls people fools in there too. Man, the Bible calls everybody fools, yet I can't call someone a fool? Well, that doesn't seem right. Jesus called these people fools, I think, when he was talking to those Pharisees. You blind guides, you whitewashed. He, Jesus was cussing them out, seems like. And I'm listening to it and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why did we turn into these kind of Christianese where we have to speak so perfect and act so perfect and pretend we're special? And then I see these rough rednecks, <laughs> these rough old boys walking with and, and manifesting the gospel, yet they're not clean, polished like the preachers on TV, and I'm thinking, what are we doing wrong? How does this even work? So I started looking into this, and when I saw what you fool means and what Raka really means, why didn't they interpret Raka? Why did they put, if you say to your brother Raka, interpret that. Don't give me a Hebrew term. Don't give me a King James 1700s terminology. Give me a modern word. And I started looking into that. He's like, you're worthy of hellfire. You're worthy of Guyana in some translations. And then I started looking into it. He says, when you put other people down, when you said your clothing, it had to do with clothing there in that context. He was saying that when they wrote this, the terminology, the Greek, the Hebrew, you look it up yourself. He was saying, you're telling them that the clothing you wear smells like Guyana, the trash dump in Israel. It's when you're constantly putting people down and saying, I'm better than you. When you suck and I'm better, you're an idiot and I'm amazing. When you're putting people down every day thinking that's what makes you better, you start feeling self-righteous, that's what Jesus was going after. And when he said, you fool, he wasn't talking about just a word. He was talking about the hatred in your heart when you're speaking certain words to people. When Paul was writing to the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He wasn't saying that with anger or hatred in his heart towards those people because he hated them. He was just so baffled that someone would walk away from the power of God to some religious organization. I like calling people fools because the things you do and walk away and you say, I don't believe in God, that's very foolish. You know better. You understand. God has talked to you, touched you, encountered you, 
and now you're choosing to throw that away to a momentary pleasures in the flesh, you know him. Seek him and you will find him. And this is the interesting part that I started finding out that when you read 1 John, the Bible tells us very simply that if you hate your brother, if you're hating a brother, you're already a murderer in your heart. Jesus said that, obviously. But 1 John was breaking it down that if you don't have love and you're still walking in darkness, you're not even born again. You're still like spiritually dead if you're hating one another. Are you even born again? Are you even a Christian? Christian just means Christ's light. You can walk out that likeness. He's in you. You can walk that out. And you're obviously not walking that out. Here's the interesting thing. If you have hatred in your heart, no matter what word you're saying, it doesn't have to be stupid or idiot, no matter what word you're saying, if you have hatred in your heart towards that person, say you didn't even say it in a bad word. Say you're like, God bless you, you mother blinkity blinkity blink, and you start cussing them out in your heart and you hate them, you're a murderer. But I never said a bad word. God's not looking at those words. He's looking at your heart. If you're constantly speaking and hating people in your heart, you're a murderer. Repent means change your mind and go the other way. If you can't, then ask him to help you because he's there to assist you and to guide you out of it. You need to get born again. God didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. He came to help you wake up and get unplugged from the system to help others wake up. There's such an awesome allegory there when you check out the matrix and see it from a Christian perspective and you're watching for it. You will see so much difference. Anyway, that's about all, that's about it. I think I talked about quite a couple of things, and I think I finally helped people understand the whole respect, the process, enjoy the journey. That's going to be part two, where I kind of just share it. I just thought I'd record it, so then you can hear part one and understand part two a little a little easier, but. It's if you believe. If you want to believe, you don't have to go through a long, arduous process. You get to get there a lot easier and smoother. Hey, I got arduous correct. Involving or requiring strenuous effort, difficult and tiring. <laughs> I'm surprised at the words I know. You don't have to go through those journeys where it's difficult and sane because it's the perspective you choose to have. Now challenges will happen. Difficulties will happen. It depends where you are. It's relative. Difficult terms means it's a very relative term. How difficult or how rich or how wealthy or how happy. All these terminologies, they're very relative in comparisons to what you're saying them to. Because people in some poverty nations, they feel like the book of Revelations has already happened Difficulties are every day and their life is so miserable and they're praying and they're thinking Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Then you meet people who are hanging out in Hawaii, rejoicing on the beach, and they're like, man, God's never coming back because life is good. I have everything and I'm happy. So, you know, everything's good. The book of Revelations is never going to happen. So everyone has different experiences, different life lessons that they're learning. And this is where you get to see and learn yourself. So, you're going to go through things, but you can enjoy it. You're going to see things, but you can have a good time. So I encourage you to believe all things become possible. And the lessons that you learn are so fast, so enjoyable, so effortless because he helps you. And you learn to quit striving and struggling. You don't have to pray. You don't have to read the Bible. You don't have to fast or worship. You get to. All these are just things that you get to enjoy. And God will help you enjoy it and help you achieve it with him. You're not supposed to live this life with your own abilities, with your own strength. He wants to walk this out with you. So invite him in and he'll help you do it. So thanks for redeeming your time with me. And I'll catch you on the next one.